Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Mealy, and I'm the Public Services Manager at the Grand Public Library. I want to thank you all for coming to the conclusion of our Benedict Arnold 275th birthday anniversary series. I also want to thank the Circle of Friends for sponsoring this event today. Today's program is a reenactment of Major General ben Benedict Arnold by well-known reenactor re Mr. Kevin Titus. Mr. Titus is the founder of the internationally known Determined Education of American History Productions and has appeared in several movies and historical shows on the History Channel. His reenactments include, but are not limited to, the fourth U.S. President James Madison and U.S. President Andrew Johnson. Mr. Titus is a Litchfield County Justice of the Peace Magistrate and resides in Falls Village, Canaan, Connecticut. There will be time for questions and an opportunity for pictures, if you like. Um, but at this time, if you could please set your phones to silence, that would be appreciated. Um, and now, please help me welcome Major General Benedict Arnold. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's nice to come back after 275 years and get to speak about things. My left leg, as you know, was shot three times in the Revolutionary War, and I have a hard time moving around. What I'd like to do today is kind of explain to you a lot of my background and what most of you have been told. Some is true, some is not true. There are things about my life that uh, you probably have not read correctly, and of course, some history books will state you as a villain. I never said that all the decisions that I had made was correct. However, uh, there were things in mitigating circumstances that changed everything. To give you a little rundown, as you all, a lot of you Connecticut residents and myself, I'm from Norwich, Connecticut. My family, uh, my father was named Benedict Arnold Sr. and I had several sons named Benedict Arnold. Now, I also was married previously to another woman named Sarah and she passed away during the beginning of the American War for Independence. Now, I want to start off with primarily to tell you that when I joined the Continental Army, it was not to seek independence. Let's understand that. Nobody in 1775 wanted to even think of such a thing. The thing was that they wanted to right the wrongs of His Majesty King George III. And I think most of you will understand that that's what we tried to do. The taxation, the representation, was the quartering acts, and British uh, soldiers being sent to our colonies to conquer and tell us what to do. Now, unfortunately, in 1775, I had the bug like everybody else, and I believed that we needed to change some things. But before I served my country, as you all claim that I did, my father had an extremely well-trading company, shipping, very good in the shipping industry. We had a quite wealth, had a gathered quite some wealth, and I had planned for a future for my family. But what had happened was that during the war and such, and previous to the war, my father, as you might have also known, was a drunkard. He drank himself to death, and I had to carry him out of all kinds of inns and things through my teen years. But I knew that I had the intelligence to continue the business of my family. So I continued the shipping business. It was very successful for quite some time. And then in 1775, uh, there were problems, as you know, that started between the United States and His Majesty the King George III. At that point, I realized that we had to make some kind of decision to make King George understand what we were doing and that this was, had to stop. So on the anniversary around April the 22nd of 1775, as you might have all known, I reached out and seized the keys to the New Haven Powder House under His Majesty, no, the Continental Congress. I was a captain at the time in charge of the local militia. We seized the powder and we took it to be stored in case of the Continental Army's reformation. Well, we did that. 
And then I decided to meet with George Washington at Dorchester Heights, which is near Boston. And he offered me a command. First of all, the command that I first achieved was with his help in the Continental Congress. And I was asked thoroughly and fully if I could help in any way to make something better for our army. Well, I found out, as you've all heard of Fort Ticonderoga, had a tremendous powders and tremendous guns. And I knew with what a very small detachment that they did have, that we could seize it without any bloodshed. My purpose was to seize those cannons and turn them over to George Washington. Well, what had happened was I had a command, a legal command from the Continental Congress, and I was asked to take that command. And I was to meet with Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys and Zeth Warner from the colony of Vermont, which is now a state. And at that time, it was part of New York. The Ethan Allen and the uh, Green Mountain Boys didn't exactly feel <laughs> that I had the command of capabilities, but I did have the orders from the Continental Congress saying that I was to command this unit. And I agreed to share the command evenly. So we did the best we did. They still were lingering in their laughter about my abilities, but I proved them wrong very quickly. On the night of May 6th of 1775, I immediately jumped up and knocked on the commanding officer door and said, in the name of the Connell Congress and the great Jehovah, I take command of Fort Ticonderoga. Before the Green Mountain Boys could knock on the door, I did it. See, the commander came out and I told him to immediately surrender. They only had seven men. They surrendered immediately, and I seized the cannon for the United States. At that time, it was the Continental, or the US Continental Congress, that approved my answers. Some month later, a few months later, George Washington was amazed at what I was doing, and I ordered a, an attack on Canada in Quebec. I'm sure you've all heard about this, the attack on Quebec. Well, it would have been successful if I had had the support from Montgomery and some other officers that, again, doubted my command potential. When I got to the gates of Quebec, I was the first command to break through and seize part of Quebec. Where was Montgomery? Nobody seems to know. Later on, we found out Major Montgomery had been killed by grape shot, tragically. That is why he didn't succeed in meeting the gates like I did. The British armies were much too powerful for us at the time, so we had to pull back. A few months later, I got with the Continental Congress and George Washington, and I told him I had a plan, another plan to seize the British Navy off of Velcor Island, New York. They now are claiming that I com uh, commanded the first naval, or I should say the first Navy unit of the Continental Army, as well as the first naval battle I won as a soldier. And we won Velcor Island and repulsed the British and pushed them down back from one more year from invading the colonies. In 1777, I was attached to General Gates at the Battle of Saratoga. Gates was a arrogant person, and he didn't seem to understand that my command was already proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, but uh, Gates felt that he was the commander and that I didn't deserve any recognition. So at the Battle of Bolkar's Redoubt, I seized the redoubt after being shot in my left leg, which there is a monument to my leg there at the battlefield, but not my name. <laughs> I wonder why. At any rate, Gates was going to have me court-martialed, and I said, go ahead and do it. I won the battle. What are you going to do? Correction, I did win the battle, and there was no punishment. Gates kind of looked ridiculous for a while, but they gave him a command in the southern area, and I stayed in the north. And then finally, while I was in command of the Connecticut State Militias in the line, there was an attack by the British made on Danbury, Danbury, Connecticut. And at that time, uh, I immediately got everybody together, all my militia, all my armies, and I was there within four hours. We were involved in the Battle of Richfield. And at the Battle of Richfield, I took the second wound to my leg. I was shot twice and my horse was shot from underneath me. And a guy took it and General Wooster had been killed and I took command and I pushed the British back to the sound where they started from, preventing them from burning all the iron forges in the northwest part of Connecticut. It was stopped because of my abilities. At that point I was supposed to be given an award, I got a sword. 
I got, as you see over there, a presentation sword. It was presented to me by a George Washington Continental Congress. And then after that, I was given, I told George Washington that I had problems with getting the proper command. I felt I was best for the battles, and I knew I could command well. George Washington agreed. However, Connell Congress didn't. For some reason, they owed me a tremendous amount of back pay. Um, I put a lot of money out of my own to maintain and arm and protect and equip my own troops. Apparently, Connell Congress didn't either have the money or didn't feel they wanted to reimburse me in any way. So George Washington felt that he would try to get something together and try to get some of my back pay, which never occurred. And then I did request that I wanted promotions. I was due promotions as a brigadier general. I didn't get that until I changed some other side. At that time, George Washington felt that he would take me out of the battlefield for a little while and that he would go ahead and put me as commandant in command of Philadelphia, which we had just uh, got back from the British. The British had released it to us back after Brandywine. And what had happened was at that time, I had to use my monies again to keep myself and my, and my family alive. Now, talking about family, I had met a new young girl by the name of Peggy Shippen. Peggy was very young. I was much older than she was. And her family was an ardent loyalist family. And her father was a judge. The thing was that uh, people felt that this relationship wasn't good because I, here I am the commandant of the Continental Army in Philadelphia, and she was an ardent loyalist. However, they didn't cause any problems of any kind. So it turned out that there's, as I was commandant for about a year, there was charges made of that I had may have taken in some extra monies or something that didn't belong to me. Well, that's not exactly what happened. What happened was that I was able to prepare my shipping and my trading company once again on my spare time from being commandant and try to rebuild my family's business. And that money was supposed to go back into my retirement and my family's retirement and things of that nature after the war. Of course, people suspected that was something that I had just decided to take money and, 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 and do my own thing. Well, that's a little misleading. From that point on through the 1780, I was very much involved with George Washington and his command. I was one of his personal aides, and he was one of my best friends, personal friends. And I believe he taught me uh, to be like a son to him, and I respected him for that. Uh, I want everybody to know that I never, ever intended to disrespect General Washington or the United States in any shape. Their thinking and my thinking were two different things. By 1780, the Revolutionary War was extremely bleak. The Americans were losing. We had not won anything. The Southern battles were being all won by the British forces. General Lord Cornwallis, who was a master of military, um, could outdo any British um, um, thought in back combat. He was um, a great maneuver against the Continental Army. And during the South, basically, the South remained in the British hands almost throughout the entire Revolutionary War. So as we were losing the war, there were things coming to point. I begged again for George Washington Connell to please give me a battle of command. I can turn this around. Let me have a chance to change this around. George Washington wanted to, but for some reason he never quite did enough to help me get to that point. And I think that's why he took it personal later against what I inevitably did. In the early, um, late summer of 1780, uh, I was made, met uh, contact with the British commander at the time, was, uh, New York commander was uh, Sir Henry Clinton. He had said that he wanted to end this rebellion in the uh, colonies as quickly as possible, and he wanted to stop the infusion of bloodshed and everything, and I felt the same way. George Washington and the Continental Congress would not allow me to help win this war, as you know I did for previous years before that. Now, take it as you like. Yes, I was beginning to feel a little bit more about myself, and I was also thinking about the men that I served with. But to make things bleak, as time went on, and I was never going to be given another battle command, and I was not giving a, a firmer uh, promotion to full general, I maintained a med, uh, brigadier major general, which is not a full general. It's more like being a fantastic colonel. And they really don't take very good care of colonels. So at the time, uh, the British and I, um, there was correspondence. The British were planning to attack and absolutely destroy Fort West Point. And it was a strong point. I honestly don't think that it could have been held out against the massive British forces that came upon them. 
So on, partly on, on that summer of 1780, uh, there was a British, uh, the British uh, commander of New York decided to send Major John Andre out to negotiate terms. Now, as a commanding officer of any military district, I have to look at the facts. I have to look at, are my men going to be brutally massacred? Are they going to be taken prisoner? Or do we have a chance to push them back? Well, West Point was so badly defended. People think it was highly defended. It wasn't. We had very little cannon. Most of the cannons were made of wood. It was just to deploy and, and, and make the British think we had big guns there. Honestly, if the British had really taken this seriously and attacked West Point, they would have wiped it out and taken it anyhow. And just think of the men that would have been killed, maimed, wounded, and what would have happened to the Revolution. Remember one other thing about the Revolutionary War. Do you understand when our forefathers signed that document, which this year now is the 240th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Major, big year now for everybody in America. Um, do you know when our forefathers signed that document, one of the most favorite of all was ben Benjamin Franklin, and he said, gentlemen, we can sign this document individually and hang individually, or we can sign this together and surely we'll hang together. Now what they're telling you is, we had to win this thing because anybody that signed that name, that's it. They would have been committed treason. Who else would have been a traitor? Everybody. What would have happened to George Washington if we'd won that war? Do you think it would have happened to him too? They would have hung George Washington as a, as a traitor. So I didn't think Benny Arnold or myself felt that it was any different at the time. The war was looking very bleak. So the South was being completely wiped out by the British forces. They were moving their way up to the North. There was a four-prong attack. The Canadians, um, the, the uh, Western New York, New Englanders, and the South. And the British were going to come in. They were going to attack New York. And New York would have been wiped out um, completely. And the British would have even wanted it then. So what they were doing is they're going to come there and they're going to take West Point and they're going to wipe it out. I, my feeling was, well, Continental Congress doesn't care about their officers. They don't care about any victories. I don't know what they're thinking. So my thinking was I was going to meet with Major Andre and discuss the terms of surrender of West Point. Now, I'm not saying that was a good thing. I'm not sure it was totally a bad thing. The war went on, as you know, three more years, three more brutal years. And uh, the British government uh, contacted me and told me that they would offer me, yes, 10,000 pounds, which was quite a substantial amount of money at that time, um, which would have replaced all the losses that I had lost in my family and all my military pay that I have never been paid. And I had thought at this point that if I could peacefully turn West Point over and save some in lives, that was what I thought I would do. But I was still leery of this. Believe me, I still had my allegiance to George Washington, and I felt, you know, if I did this, this is not a really good thing. Now, you remember Peggy Shippen. Okay, that was my wife. She was an ardent, ardent loyalist. She was on my back quite a bit. And she said, look, they're not going to give you anything. You're not going to get any promotions. They're not going to give you the battle honors. Nothing's ever going to be good. What are you going to be remembered for? So I looked, and I said, I said, you know, it's right. It seems like, it seems like this is the decision to make. Now, at that time, George Washington was having regrets, too. He was talking about what he should do. And um, I think he took it very personal when I did make this move to change. But what had happened was it wasn't something I wanted to hurt George Washington or our cause. As I said before, I wanted to try to see if this would end it and put an end to this and let us get back to living. Well, of course, Peggy Shippen pushed the issue. Major Andre made a deal. We did the deal, and Major Andre made one mistake. The first mistake Major Andre did was when I sent him back to his ship, he went back in plain clothes, civilian clothes. That is a diehard spy title. When you get caught out of uniform, you will be executed as a spy. There's no other way. He didn't listen to my orders, and I gave him a pass to get back and to stay in your British uniform. So if you'd been caught, they wouldn't have executed you. So the least they could do is make you prisoner of war, and they would want to know what you were doing with me. At that point, I didn't realize that George Washington was on his way the day that this meeting occurred. And I immediately decided to contact the vulture, the HMS vulture, and tell them that I, I'm, I needed to leave now, that, that I would be probably executed upon being picked up without any explanation as to what my meanings were. So I had to leave my wife, Peggy, there. And she acted in, you know, very shocked, but that was what part of the thing we felt. She would stay there, and um, George Washington wouldn't hurt a woman. We knew that. We knew he wouldn't do anything to her. 
So I made it back to the uh, HMS Vulture, and I went back to New York to become with the British Army. As you see on my right, you'll see the hat and the uniform that the British gave me in 1780. And from 1780 to 1783, that was the uniform that I wore. From 1775 to 1780, early, I wore this uniform, which was a major general. That was a brigadier general. Now, with the money and everything else, I thought, you know, things would get, they loved my knowledge. They wanted to see how I could help them. I knew a lot about New England. I had to put an end to the war. So now we're getting to what happened here in Connecticut, which most of you probably want to know the answers to. And you'll be able to ask me questions when I'm finished, but let me tell you the story. If you recall, in October of 1781, the Battle of Yorktown occurred, which ended basically the major fighting in the Revolutionary War. Now, fighting didn't end until 1703. There was shooting and personal killings and things of that nature until 1783 and raids until the official declaration, which was November 25th of 1783, which the British were told to get out. And they agreed to get out. Now, from 17, as soon as I began on the British and put on that uniform, I was given command of a very famous legion known as the Legion, better known as Arnold's Legion. We were the ones, the only ones that wore yellow with red. That was to let you know that we also were loyalists. On our collar here, we have a thing called an RP, which means Royal Provincials. And all the British didn't want us to look anything like them because they used to wear white buff or red. We did yellow. We wanted to show that we were different. My legion was composed of many deserters and officers from the Continental Army that were frustrated over what was going on on the American side. The war was going very badly. They weren't getting paid. Their homes were being burned, not being protected. How do you think those people felt? Loyalists and patriots alike in Connecticut, New England, all around this country. One day, you're your neighbors with your person. You're all the same, your friends, your neighbors. Two weeks later, he's a loyalist, he's a patriot. You hate each other. You're burning each other's homes down. What did that solve? So my plan was to put an end to this as quickly as possible. I put together one of the largest loyalist legions of the war. It consisted of at least 5,000 loyalist soldiers, which comprised of continental, former continental army, and uh, enlisted officers. We got together and we planned a major plan with Sir Guy Carleton in New York to see if we could pull George Washington out of this, the South in Virginia, which was Yorktown. The whole plan of the attack on New London and Groton was not what happened totally. The plan was to destroy the privateering nest of rascals. What they were doing is they were coming here and they were destroying loyalist property. People didn't do anything to these other people, but they were taking their property, burning their homes, you know, killing their families, taking their families prisoner. How would you feel? So these people joined my legion and we became a large, one of the biggest loyalist armies of the war. My plan in New London was to destroy the, the facilities and the capabilities of the privateers from, and the patriot refugees from destroying people's personal property. Because at this point, it looked like the British and his magic were gonna win this war. So we wanted to get this over as quickly as we could and cut down this bloodshed. It had gotten terrible. People believe that the American Civil War, 100 years later, was the um, first Civil War. It was not. The American Revolution was the first Civil War. It was between loyalists and patriots. Continental uniforms and British uniforms, that was just the main army battles. That just didn't always happen. It was mostly between people like you and me, down the street, next town, next county. Hey. Those people are loyalists. Let's take their stuff. Let's take them prisoner, lock them up at Newgate Prison. Let's do what we can to make them unhappy. Well, people get tired of that after a while, both sides. So on that day, on, December, on September 6th of 1781, I, Brigadier General Benedict Arnold, took command of the entire British assault force, and I attacked New London. We, yes, we did burn New London to the ground. The problem was because it was the worst nest, uh, nest of rabbles that there ever was. Now, we're not saying that some of the atrocities, as they're called, were necessary. I don't believe they were. And I'll tell you how you'll feel a little better about that. My orders were to destroy all military supplies, all shipping supplies. All personal property of anybody was to be left untouched. Churches were to be respected. They were not to be burned. 
That day, we had some refugees in my group. You know, it takes one to know one. You're going to have bad and good in every army. You're going to have your bad ones and your good ones. They burned the town, and to this day, New London still is very upset with me to this day. So when we, re, um, this past September, we recreated that burning and the attack. But to go back into the actual attack, we also had to take out Groton. Groton, Connecticut was also a nest, a big shipyard that had to be destroyed. There was a fort there, and everybody might remember the name of the fort called Fort Griswold or known as the Battle of Groton Heights. What had happened on that day was probably the most saddest thing that's ever happened in my command, is I had sent a Major Montgomery, Major Avery, and a Major Bloomfield to take Groton and take care of the military supplies. The problem was they said, we have a fort, we need to go and attack this fort. And I gave sent orders, I sent orders, telling Major Montgomery to not attack Fort Grizzle. Go around it. Avoid it. What's 185 men? Forget it. Just go around it, burn the town, and get out of there. Well, that wasn't what happened. That morning, about 1045 in the morning, my legion, under the command of Bloomfield, Avery, and Montgomery, attacked Fort Grizzle with such viciousness and arrogance that was beyond what my command was capable of dealing with. What they had done was on the attack, the battle lasted for 45 minutes, and both sides sustained extremely hard casualties. Now, we all know what happened at the end of the battle, and I'll get into that in a minute, but let me explain you why that happened. A month before Fort Grizzle, before the attack in New London, we were made a raid uh, in New Jersey, on the coast of Jersey, a place called Dallas Landing. It's now Cumberland County, New Jersey, I understand, and they just dedicated a plaque to that battle. What had happened on that day, my legion, we found out from our archives that we had a small legion, about eight or nine men, that were going on a whaleboat to rescue seven or eight of our brothers who wanted to join us in New York. They wanted to get out of New Jersey because they were going to be killed. Their family had been destroyed. Their homes and property were taken away, and they just wanted to leave. Well, the Burlington County Militia of New Jersey decided that wasn't going to happen. So they chased these men all the way to the shores of Dallas Landing, and killed every single one of them. Not one was taken prisoner. They attacked our whaleboats, what we called a rescue team. We were there to do a rescue team. We weren't there to engage anybody. We wanted to get our people out of there. Well, they shot them down, and our people had one kill that were in the boat were even involved with these other gentlemen. So we went back to New York, made our reports, and of course, I, Ben Donald, got the report. So you have to understand, a month later, these same people that were at Dallas Land, New Jersey, had something of a, uh, a revenge feeling now. They weren't feeling very good towards patriots. You just killed eight of their own number in cold blood. I'm not saying it was right. None of this is right. But unfortunately, you gotta think of the state of mind of the British soldier at that day. They had people that had been killed for no reason, and they weren't involved, weren't going to tolerate, I guess, any further um, interfering with the activities. So they attacked, and they were mostly loyalist armies. Uh, everybody said it was British, but they were mostly the Brit uh, loyalists that attacked Fort Griswold. Very few were actual British soldiers. So they attacked the fort in 45 minutes. The white flag came up. Major Ledyard came out, uh, Colonel Ledyard, I'm sorry, came out to want to surrender. And the honors of the days was you would take your sword and say, who commands this fort? You'd say, I did, sir, but you do now, and he turned his sword over. That should have been the end of it. Surrender, honor, take your prisoners and go. Well, apparently, somebody during the battle, they say, the grape shot hit the white flag as that procedure was going on. The white flag came down, and everybody thought that the Patriots had taken the white flag down to start the battle at their advantage because the British were so close then. Well, that's not really happened, but they immediately, Ledyard was standing there, and Colonel Montgomery took the sword, and he, after he asked who on him commands the sword, he said, I did, sir, you do now. And he took that sword, and he rammed it right through his chest. This is the loyalist commander. Ledyard died instantly. His, uh, his slave, his armed, I would say his freeman, his name, his name was Jordan Freeman, a black, free African-American, took a spike and immediately stabbed Montgomery dead for that. 
at that time, Avery killed him, and then another patriot. Everybody, everybody start getting their guns up and sit up and shooting it out all over again. And this fighting went on for another 15 minutes till there was nobody could stand. The story was that there was so much blood on the property that, that you couldn't walk a step without stepping in it. And to make it sadder was the prisoners that did survive were put into a cart. Uh, ammo cart, I think they called it. There was about 20 of them. And some of the people hadn't quite been tired with their revenge, decided we were going to take them down and parole them. It's an old thing we used to do with parole. If you were so sick or so badly wounded that we would parole you on the spot, you knew you couldn't hurt us anymore, and we'd let you go. That's basically how they did it back then. Well, a couple of the loyalist officers decided, to, hmm, why should we take these men prisoner? And they were pulling the chains of this giant wagon, and they let the wagon go. And the wagon went down the hill and crashed into the trees, which finished off the rest of the parts. Now, you can see how barbaric this became. You know, and, and, and uh, when I was uh, uh, told of it, I was absolutely very mad at what my commanders had done. And I had ordered court-martials of every single one of them. But did you know what? Not one of them survived. Bloomfield was also killed during the last clash with the Patriots until the final shooting. So needless to say, we pulled out of New London and Groton with probably the most savage memory people can remember of the end of the war. But the plan of that attack was not to do this devastation. It was to bring the American forces back up to the north to protect the northeast. That was the whole purpose. It was a strategic move. Didn't work, apparently. And a month later, the Battle of Yorktown occurred and the British surrendered. Now, at that time, you wonder, what was, what was I thinking? Well, here I'm a British commander, and I'll give you a little bit of a background about what happened with me. George Washington had sent out orders. He was so instilled and so upset about what had happened that he had an order for me to be captured immediately and to be hanged. The point was, George Washington agreed, if you all remember Major John Andre, who was hung in his place, they offered to let him go if they would turn Benedict Arnold back over. Well, they didn't because they had an agreement with Benedict Arnold, so they couldn't do that. He was their big commander now. He had just made a big raid that made him look good in the British eyes at that time, but later on it didn't go very well for him. So at that time, the things happened, and then he made uh, Major General, uh, Ma Brigadier General Arnold and myself uh, planned one more major attack before the end of the war. And later that year, about December of 1781, after Yorktown, there was a raid with um, um, a gentleman by the name of Tarleton, Bannister Tarleton, better known, all of you probably heard of him from, if you ever heard of the movie called Patriot. There's a man there called Tavitin, if you remember that movie. He was a barbaric, wearing a green uniform. Well, that's based on the life of Tarleton. And Tarleton had orders from Benedict Arnold to seize, are you ready for this, Jefferson Davis, the founder of the Declaration of Independence. How did he know where he was? Well, they had good intel. They found him that he was the governor at that time in Monticello, who was at his house. And he sent a small detachment of Legion and Tarleton's Rangers to go after him. Their orders were, we may not win this war, but we're going to get Jefferson and we're going to hang him from his own portico, just to make a point. So he was on their way in 30 minutes, 30 minutes from being captured. He got word from his, I guess, his um, servants. Somebody was out in the field, and somebody came running and said, the British are coming to get Governor Jefferson. He was then the governor of Ma uh, Virginia at the time. And the next thing he did was say, oh, oh my goodness, they're not going to come here. You know, what do I got to worry about? And he wasn't even armed or anything. Finally, about 35 minutes from it, the word came out that he, they were coming. They could see the smoke from the town. They were burning the nearest town near Monticello. They could see it. And he said, you know what? I think it's time to go. So he got hooked up his horses, got his two pistols. He had two pistols for defense, and he ran. And within that amount of time, then McDonald's orders were made very clear. Tarleton walked up, broke into the house, said they could find him. They didn't find him. They didn't burn his home, which is an amazing thing because he said that the architecture was so beautiful, they didn't want to destroy it. So he decided, well, he, he said, the old goose is lucky we didn't get him because we were going to have him for dinner tonight. So he got away, and um, Tarleton went back because he was also a much wanted um, soldier <laughs> next to Ben Arnold. They wanted him for some barbaric things back in the war himself. 
But what we're saying is Benny Dornell's theory on a lot of this was, you know, okay, now I think I've done a wrong thing here, okay? I've given up, I've given up my home, I've given up the family that I had left, I've given up everything. And so see how bad it was for him, even before he was fully known as a turncoat or a traitor, the people did some horrible things to him. His wife who had died, his first wife, uh, Sarah died in 1775, and what she did was, she died of a, a disease, I'm not sure what it was called at that time, but they think it was a form of lung cancer. And when she had passed away, um, they buried her and uh, her, his father and his sons. And all the gravestones in Norwood Cemetery that had been Arnold were destroyed. Everybody just kept on, now these people's graves were unmarked. Now why do we have to blame his wife and his father and his children for what he did? That to me is, is a tragedy and it's wrong. They burned his house. Uh, somebody had it for a while and they decided, well, this is a traitor's house. So they burned, somebody set fire to it suspiciously. I think it was back in the later 1790s. Then to go into more of my life as it came on the old days, what had happened. Towards the end of my life, I went to command to the king and I went to Cornwallis who then was been a lord in England. In the 1790s, they were fighting India and in India, I wanted to be a part of this. I wanted to be a part of my military career. I had given ever so much to the King of England. What are they gonna give me back? Well, guess what? I never got another command. They never trusted me with another British command. They did nothing. Their pensions were minimal. I couldn't even live. I had debts that mounted immensely big because of what I had done and what the English had done to me. So on the morning of October, I'm sorry, June 6th, 1801, I was dying in my bed, and Peggy was there, my children, my daughter was there, and we were living in Bathysee's, uh, England, which is near London. And I called out to my wife, I knew I was dying, and I said, Peggy, I said, please bring me my old uniform. So Peggy brought it to me, laid it on top of me, and I looked up there and I said, Peggy, God forgive me for ever putting on another. And I died. And at that point, they buried me in the St. Mary's Battersea Church in a crypt that at first was um, very well marked, but then it, they kind of let it go to despair. And then, of course, uh, when they were doing rebuilding of the church, they kind of lost where I was buried, my remains. And they um, have never done an exhumation to do anything about that. But there is a plaque there dedicated to my family and I, and it says in grateful remembrance from both countries to our hero at one time and to the new English leader. And as you know, in the Saratoga, the battlefield, there's a monument to my leg, and it's, it, it's my leg, and it says in grateful remembrance of a, of, of a um, masterful general, but they don't have my name on it. Velcor Island, they don't have any monument, they just say that I was there. But you see, you gotta remember, Benny Darnold was a very tragic figure. I mean, he did make all the right decisions. We all know that. But you gotta remember, what would you have done in his situation? None of us could have, would have known. You don't know how the world was. I mean, okay, remember again, if we had lost the war, okay, what would you all be now? We'd all be British. What would all our heroes that you read about, George Washington, John Zim, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, James Madison, what would they be now? Traitors. Where would they all be? Probably in a hole somewhere. Memorials to them? No. To Dexter's Independence, what would they have done with that? Destroyed it, correct? Okay, now let's look at the British side of it. What did the British not do for him? What happened to the honors he was entitled to? What did he do? He gave so much, he gave everything up for the British crown. What did they do for him? Nothing. In fact, when he passed away, not one representative from the, uh, the, the country of England stood there. He had a wagon and they just put him in a coal. Now you tell me, how do you think Peggy felt? She lived a few more years after him and she had to pay all his debts. But she kept telling everybody that Benedict was not as bad as you think he was. He was a good father, he was a great soldier. And to make you even feel better, George Washington once said, if anything should happen to me in this revolution, he said, I hope that you'll make Benedict Arnold the commanding officer. He could be probably the best fighting man this country has ever seen. 
uh, Battle of Brighton Heights, where the cannon was fired once, and because uh, Benedict Arnold knew the code that three, the two more meant cancel it. How does that fit into um, your version of the story? Um, good question. Um, well, I'll give an example. When they when they landed the landing force at New London at Fort Trumbull, the first instant was for them to let these men know we're coming. So what he basically, he kind of did what we call a slow landing party. He came in, wanted to kind of scare them out of there. He didn't really want to fight them. He just wanted them to go. And there was only about 13 men that were in the fort, and there were like maybe six guns. And so they landed like three of them, opened fire, a couple shots, maybe hit one or two British soldiers, and then uh, said, okay, spike the guns, and got in the world boats and headed over to Fort Griswold. When Fort Griswold, the, st the signal you're talking about, was basically Fort, when Fort Trumbull had abandoned their guns, they were supposed to notify them, which they did. And that's actually what the gunfire was. It wasn't only to try to stop them. What are 13 men going to do with a, an 800 for, uh, you know, invasion force? Not much. So they, they just basically spiked the guns, fired the cannons, warned them that the British are here. They got across the, the, the Thames River, and we got to Fort Griswold. Fort Griswold opened fire to tell the men over there, we're ready. And then the Groton church bells, which I did a presentation of the uh, church bells back in September, they rang the church bells to get every man and woman and son that could handle a firearm, a firelock, and get over to Fort Griswold to join with the militia over there. Because their whole purpose was, it was kind of like they were thinking that if we could show some kind of a staunch force here, the British may not want to come over here. And that was actually basically a pretty good idea because even, uh, that's why uh, Benedict Arnold said, look, I want you to avoid it. There's no sense in wasting. Let's just get in here and get out and get out of here. Let's people think we're here just to burn like, their businesses and stuff like that. That kind of upsets people when you destroy businesses. And people's like, hey, man, you better get the army up here and protect us. You see, that's what they were thinking was going to work. And, uh, but it turned out, like you said, it went to a massacre. And they wasted over an hour, an hour and a half, two hours at Fort Griswold. And they only got to burn part of Groton and part of the shipping in Groton. So basically, Groton survived. They were very lucky. Um, New London was completely obliterated. Um, anybody else? Another question? Yes? I think part of it was because um, two of their commanders were killed almost immediately in the first in the Battle of Groton. Groton Heights, yes. Groton Heights, and mm -hmm. um, they were really angry about that, and that's when they really went Exactly. Uh, that was the first one went down was Montgomery, and I believe. Um, and Montgomery was the first to be killed as he was coming over the wall from um, Morgan, uh, what's his name, a gentleman named Freeman, uh, African free, free man. He was, he was uh, Ledyard's um, bodyguard, I think. And when he saw his, his commander being killed, he immediately took a pike and stabbed Montgomery instantly. See, Montgomery was, like, was the leading commander, and he was not supposed to be doing what he did. It, as I told you the story what happened in August, a lot of people were very upset about that massacre of their guys a month ago. So you have to understand their frame of mind was an I don't care. We want a little retribution here. And I think that was wrong. But yes, and then I believe Freeman was killed immediately by uh, Avery. He stabbed or shot him. And then Avery was killed by a musket ball from a, um, uh, I, I believe, a militiaman on the, other, on the left side. And then there was only that one captain or lieutenant that survived. It's written anyway that Montgomery said before he died that take no quarter after that. Right, exactly. Once, one, well, they, you got to remember also the flag went down, but they didn't take it down. It was hit by grape shot during the battle, but they took it as an insult. And you never, ever, once a flag of white goes up, you don't open fire. It's over. It's done. And if you raise it and open fire on somebody then, that's no quarter. It's automatic. You, you get cut down. It doesn't matter. You've already lost the respect of the opposing force. They're going to take you out. And that's how they did it. And that's why it became such a massacre. And it was, it was horrible. I mean, it was just... You know, they didn't plan for it to go that way or that far. Now, there's other things about Benny Darnold that you might want to know. Is there any questions about his, his personal life that you'd like to know or any more of his military commands? Do you have any other questions? Please, feel free. It doesn't matter if it's anti, it, it's okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What happened to the children from his first wife? Um, all his children, uh, most of them died at an early age, um, unfortunately, from... Um, was that smallpox that was pretty common back then, and they died. And I only think one son and two daughters survived. I think he had like eight children. 
And uh, they all were buried and died in England with him in, in the crypt over there at St. Battersea's. But he had a tra that's another thing, he had a tragic life. His whole family was just, you know, just died over a period from the war, from smallpox or from, they had to be kicked out of Norwich and they had to go hide somewhere. So eventually they had to come to England and, uh, and get away from the attacks. I mean, everybody wanted to kill anybody that was Benny Darnold. They, you know, you were a wife. They wanted to come after you. Yes, sir. I read that he had two older sons, and uh, when he went to England, they both joined the army. Yes, and one he died. He died in combat. And they went to India and fought. Right, India. And then that's where he wanted to go. He was supposed to get a commanding officer to do for Cornwallis. See, Cornwallis had been shipped back to England after the Revolutionary War. He was a great lord. I mean, he was a good man. And he offered Benny Darnold things, but the king wouldn't do a darn thing to help him out. That's how bad it was. Okay, I guess the king, well, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but King George wasn't all that well himself either. Throughout the whole Revolutionary War, he made decisions that were not like any of you know. One minute he'd be stable, the next minute he was unstable. That's why the Revolutionary War couldn't be fought properly at all. And Lord North was kind of what we call the fanatic of the, of, the, of the prime ministers at that time. I don't know how you could compare him to, but he was pretty bad. And he's the one that instigated a lot of things. Well, somebody else had their hand up for something. Would you, ma'am? Did you ask a question? It was the same question. I wanted oh. to know how the family fared um, when they were in England, how the people treated the family there. Well, at first, um, he was, his family and his wife were looked at as... Um, somewhat of a novelty, you know, like, hey, this, this is this great guy that dropped, you know, George Washington and all these things. But you see, after the war and we won our independence, you know, they looked at him like, hmm, you know, well, you're not really one of us anymore, so we don't care. So you got to remember, this man made a decision that was pretty bad. Either way he went, it's a catch-22. You know, you damned if you do and damned if you don't. And in, in my opinion, he, he was, I think he felt that the money was a big issue for him because he didn't have anything. I mean, the, the government wouldn't give him a thing. Uh, they owed him money. And as a matter of fact, the uh, Congress refused to pay him for everything that he had ever put out on himself to make this war go on. That was why later on after the Revolution War, there was many things that happened in the American colonies after that when it became states. There were several revolts, you know, things, Whiskey Rebellion, Shays Rebellion, things of that nature. Did he know? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, um, Nathaniel Green was one of the people that supported him after his victory at Saratoga. He even felt that, uh, we used to call him Granny, Granny Gates, um, was uh, not telling the truth about his situation. And um, they were friends. And I think Nathaniel Green tried to correspond with him through the British um, writing letters to saying, look, let's try to work this out. I'll talk to Washington. We'll see if we can't, we'll figure something out here. But, you know, nobody wanted to hear that. As far as they wanted, they were to hang Benny Arnold for what he did. And people call him a villain. Well, what's a villain? You got to remember, he didn't create the massacre. He was in charge of the British. So usually the commander usually gets blamed for that, no matter who did it. Um, and his decisions were different. Yes, he shouldn't have maybe done what he did. There's no doubting that. But you got to remember, think of what he did for America. What did he do for America? He won like three or four of the most major victories that got us going in the right place. Now, why don't we give him a little credit for what he did? We all make mistakes. He never, ever killed anybody. This is a funny thing. During his battles with the British, he never killed an American citizen. And he said the worst thing he ever did was attack his home state. He didn't want to do that. You know, he was actually ordered to do that. But they needed him because he knew the coast. He knew how to deal with this. He knew how to take care of the shipping. And I honestly think that if, if, if the other three commander, loyalist commanders had done what he had ordered, um, it wouldn't have happened. But here's the catch. He did send a letter over to the commanders of Fort Crusoe from New London. He could see him from his binoculars what was going on. And he said, I'm commanding them to stop that fighting now. But nobody cared. And even if they did, they were all dead by the time it was over. There was only one commander, and his name was um, um, jo uh, Jonathan Enspeen, I think. He was a lieutenant or a captain. He was the only superior ranker left after Griswold. And he, he said, stop it now. This is it. We're done. And he got the order, and he read the orders. But nobody cared anymore. It was over. And, and Groton, and he left such a wake of horror and, and havoc and sadness. It was so unbearable. So to this day, people are... 
you know, still blame Ben Grohl. They still think he's a bad guy. And, and I'm, yeah, he was bad for what he did, but he was also good. There's a good and bad in everybody. Ben Grohl just made it, I think he made a wrong choice and at the wrong time. The man was quite brilliant. I'll have to give him credit where credit was due. But you got to give him his bad credit too. You make that decision, whether you think Benny Darnold was a hero or a turncoat. That's up to you. There's enough books out there then. And I'm Kevin Titus, and I'm the only portrayer of him. And if you have any more questions, thank you for coming to see me. Thank you. Thank you.